Well, praise the Lord, here we are again for another Sunday evening service. In the month of April, we're still looking through the gospel and talking about the gospel, taking a view of it from Paul's perspective when it comes to the book of Galatians. So this is our Discipleship Empowerment Service for Sunday evening, and I'm, my name is James Paul Humphreys, and I'm just glad to be with you. And as we continue on our journey of looking at the gospel, of or the gospel concerning the book of Galatians, I think we are going to continue to see, as we move forward, a lot of interesting things. We don't have much many more lessons. We actually have only tonight and next Sunday, and we will be finished the book of Galatians. But I am so thankful that we've taken time to look at Galatians because it shows us the importance of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus Christ. And he's trying to get the Galatian church back on track when it comes to the gospel. And so tonight, when we talk about this word gospel again, we've titled it as our message for tonight, Carriers and Sowers of the Gospel Seed. Because we're going to see that as it talks tonight, the portion of scripture we're going to look at, it talks about sowing and being carriers and actually also reaping. All these words are going to be interconnected as we look into Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. But I think, I think what, not only do we understand or need to understand what the gospel is, but we also need to understand there is something that we need to do with the gospel. It's not just good enough just to hear it and to kind of keep it and put it on the shelf. It's like sometimes people get Bibles and they get a nice Bible and they keep it and they put it on the shelf. But Well, until you open it up and unpackage it and start using it and start understanding it, the, the Bible actually doesn't have much of any uh, importance at all to a person who doesn't do that. The Bible becomes power and strength and anointing and direction and encouragement, comforting and all those parts of, of the, the gospel that is given to us by Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit begins to enlighten us along our journey as we walk for the Lord. So the gospel is not just something good to know about. It's something that needs to be activated. Amen. We need to make it part of our lives and we need to be actively sowing it and planting it and reaping it for God's glory. Amen. And so when we look at this, the Christian ministry, as we said, is twofold. It's not only witnessing, but it's also proclaiming of the gospel. We are to be ministers one to another about the gospel. That's what the church is all about, is the minister one to another about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. But then we need to take that gospel out in the highways and byways and proclaim it to others. So it's kind of a two-sided challenge that Paul is saying, hey, Galatian church, you need to get equipped. You need to be the place that you understand what the gospel is. So you can witness, be a witness of the gospel, that your life can be a witness of the gospel, but then you can also be a proclaimer of the gospel at the same time. So we need to be carriers. We need to be going out and giving out that good news to others as much as possible and sowing it. Again, the seed needs to be sown. You know, you don't catch fish unless you cast a net or cast a line. You don't receive a harvest unless you plant a seed. And all of this is important. That's why we need to be investing. We need to be taking what God gives us and investing it in ways that seeds can be planted for God's glory. And as we plant them for God's glory, then they will bring forth a harvest. And so Paul's going to talk about this because I think, I think why he's getting to this whole area of the planting of the gospel and sowing the gospel so that there can be a harvest because he just doesn't want to see the church sitting on the seed. Well, we've all got Bibles. We've all kind of basically understood the good news, but that's as far as we get. No, Paul wants them to go further out, step out into the waters. So there used to be a, a song or a chorus, 
Step out in the water. Step out in a little bit deeper. Because that's when you begin to experience the fullness of what God wants to do in our lives with the gospel. So I think, as you say, he's challenging the church. He's challenging the disciples and saying, okay, we've got this gospel. We're starting to understand what the gospel is and what it isn't. And now let's go out and start telling others and proclaiming to others this good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so sometimes we forget that when we're out and about that we should be ministers of the gospel of grace. And so there's going to be a number of key words before we read the scriptures that I just want to draw your attention to again a little bit. We're going to see about the word restore and about the word tempted. We're going to be asked to examine ourselves and how are we bearing our load concerning the gospel? How are we sowing? How are we reaping? There have to be watch out for corruption and things that would try to corrupt or destroy the good season. To realize again that there's also seasons that need the seeds need to be sown. In Manitoba, this is not a good time of year to sow a seed, but soon it will be. And we need to understand the seasons. There's different seasons around the world. And again, a lot of this gospel, matter of fact, all of it, how much it really affects our heart as we listen to the Lord and see what he has to be, that he wants to speak to us. And so our key verse for tonight, if we were to pick out a key verse, is actually Galatians Chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, with the Spirit, will reap everlasting life. So as we begin to read this passage of Scripture, let's reflect on these words. Reflect how we ourselves are to be carriers and sores of the gospel seed. I, I think that's so important. We need to be carrying it around with us all the time, ready to broadcast it, ready to put it out into the fields, ready to believe that God, when we do that, that he is going to begin to nurture it and grow it and mature it and bring forth a harvest for his glory. And that's why I think Jesus kept saying over and over in the gospel itself, that he wanted to see fruit that would last. He wants to see fruit in our vines, and he wants us to experience the joy of a harvest, of producing something for his glory. Amen. So let's look into Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 10. That's our, our portion of scripture tonight. And as we start off, it starts off like this, brother. If a man is overtaken in any trespasses, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one share or for each one share sorry, for each one shall bear his own load. Let us let him who has taught the word share with all things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will reap the flesh. In the flesh will reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, we have opportunity to let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. Again, it's, it's so exciting as we look at this passage of Scripture, how God wants us to be sowers of his seed. He gives us a seed so that we can go out and sow it. And it's talking about several times he uses this idea 
of how God wants to use us. Let us, he keeps saying, let us be involved. Let us do something. Let us see what God can do through each one of us. And I believe that God wants to do something in every one of our lives. Amen. I don't think that God is looking for spectators. I think God is looking for participators where we can get involved with whatever is seed. Remember like the, the three men that were entrusted with the different um, amounts of talents. And later on, J Jesus talks about in that parable that when the landlord or the owner of the land comes back, he is going to ask for an accounting of what has been done with what they were given. Not what they might have, but what they were given. They needed to be good stewards of that. And I think that as disciples of Jesus Christ, he gives to us, each one, the amount that we're able to work with, that we're able at that time to in take and invest in areas around about us so that it will produce a harvest so that when the Lord comes back, he can say, okay, what did you do with this? What did you do with what I gave you? And we can be able to answer and say, okay, this is the return. This is what happened, Lord. This is what happened with your seed. See, even with the, the, the men of the different talents, it wasn't their talents in the first place. But it was the Lord who gave it to them to invest it and then was going to come back and ask of them, what do they did it? And it's the same thing that Paul is trying to say concerning the gospel. The gospel is not something we make up, but it's something that God has given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And then he's given it to us with the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit so that we can invest it for his glory. And there will be a time coming when we will, I guess you could probably say very clearly, we'll be held accountable for what we did and didn't do with the gospel of Christ. So we're going to look at a number of points tonight. And we're going to look at them starting at verse 1 where it, it, it starts off by encouraging us that part of the gospel is to be also involved in restoring. He talks about restoring one another. You know, there is people that fall. There is people that fall down and there's people that struggle. Again, when I, every time I think of the idea of restoring, I often think of young children or young grandchildren that trip over something or fall down or whatever it may be. And we all do that. And we come along as a parent or grandparent and pick them up, stand them back up on their feet and restore them so that they can keep walking. That's the idea of restoring. And I think that's what the gospel does, is that when we get back to proclaiming the gospel, the, the part of the working of the gospel is that it's restoring people to life, to everlasting life, restoring people to an abundance of a harvest that God wants to give. He says, if any man is overtaken by trespasses, you who are spiritual restore, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. But be careful, consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. So, you know, there's temptations out there and people do fall to temptations. But he's saying, as you're, you know, God wants to use you to be a restorer. And if you look throughout the whole nation, of the times of Israel, God raised up restorers, or we sometimes know them as judges or others or prophets or whatever, who God raises up to speak into other people's lives to restore, to help restore them. But he was also putting a warning with that, that when you're restoring, also be careful that you yourself do not become tempted by what's happening with those people. And I've seen that happen. People have gone off and they began to try to restore someone else and have fallen into a temptation themselves. And so Paul is warning, when you're working with the gospel, the gospel is a, a good news of restoration. But be careful that while you're restoring people, that you yourself don't fall away from the true line of the gospel. Because then you're going to have struggles and trials. So he encourages us to be gentle in spirit. You know, when we're working with the people, be gentle in restoring them. You know, sometimes we, we like to just go up and, you know, you've done wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? But maybe sometimes what we need to do is, not sometimes, but a lot of times, we just need to be gentle and say, okay, yeah, you know, maybe you made a mistake here. Maybe you've fallen down. Maybe you've gone in the wrong direction. You've trespassed. You've crossed over the line. 
you know, trespassing. I don't know if you know the signs. Sometimes you go around farmers and it says no trespassing. That means you can go by the front of their property and you can go around all the four corners of the property. But if you go on the property, you're trespassing. And so he's saying, be careful. Some of those have trespassed. They've gone into the place of the enemy. They've gone into Satan's territory. And then they have fallen by the temptations because they have trespassed it into things that they were told to stay out of. He said, but be gentle. That when they call them out, call them out. And as they come out, restore them. Secondly, he says, bear one another's burden. Verses 2 to 3. And so to me, the gospel is one that bears one another. So the gospel restores, but the gospel will also help us to carry one another. You know, you're restoring, but sometimes it's not good enough to restore. You need to do more. You need to help and carry one another. Look what he says in verse 2 and 3. Bear one another's burdens so and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So again, Paul is saying to the church, church, work at restoring one another. You know, you got a problem when it comes to the gospel right now in the local church here. Work at restoring one another. Be gentle with one another, but get each other back on track. And then not only that, that you would begin to carry each one another's burdens. You know, when you spend time with people, you'll begin to find out what they're burdened with. And you can pray with them. You can help them. You can help carry maybe some of the portions of the things that they're doing. I thank God that people around the world, especially across Canada, that are helping to carry the ministry of Project Lamb. We couldn't do it all ourselves. There's no way. And we couldn't go out and do the ministry that we do in other parts of the world unless other people were helping to carry there. There is a, a unity and harmony as we work together in the gospel that we need to help carry. Some can plant finances. Some can plant physical labor. Some can, can be ones who go. Some can be encouragers. Some will be on the other side of the world to take the seed that has been sent to them and hand it out to others. And others will go out and sow. There, so there's this whole idea of helping one another. And the gospel is there to help us to bear one another's burdens. And we should be doing it with the whole area of not thinking that we're better than one another, but we're doing it equally with one another. And this whole idea, when he says here, for if anyone thinks himself to be someone, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And and so when you talk about this, thinking you're better or, you know, you're a better person, be careful, Paul was warning when it comes to the gospel, because it's like yoke fellowship. Yoke fellowship is like a yoke between two oxen, and the two oxen need to bear one another's burdens or the burden that they're pulling together. And when they do it together, the burden becomes lighter. And so the gospel does that. Thirdly, uh, as we first of all, we said gospel restores. Then the gospel helps us to bear one another's burdens. But now thirdly, in verse 4, I see here how the gospel can also cause us to examine ourselves. But let each one examine himself, his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. So God wants us to be able to have rejoicing in what we are doing. Let a man examine himself. Or as James says, hey, go go up to the mirror, have a look in the mirror, examine yourself and see how you're doing. See how it's going. See what's being sown and see what's being reaped examine what kind of fruit that is coming forth. Is it a fruit of the world or is it a fruit of Jesus Christ? There's nothing wrong with it examining. And sometimes if you can't examine it all by yourself, you may have to ask another brother and sister and say, you know, I'm not sure where my weaknesses and some of my problems are. Can you help me? And you may not like what you hear, but other people can help you to examine maybe some of those weak areas in your life. That they can point out and say, well, you know, you could have even a stronger testimony if you could adjust this. Or if you could adjust that. If you could change some type of an attitude. And so 
But isn't it interesting that Paul says, go and examine yourselves. So why? So you'll have something to rejoice about. That when you see the changes that are taking place, what the gospel is doing in you, not only are you going to have praise for what the gospel is doing in others, but you're going to be rejoicing because of what the gospel is doing in you. I love that. I love what he's trying to say when he's speaking to us about this whole idea of the gospel. The fifth thing that we want to look at as he goes on in verse 6 here, you know, when he talks about, sorry, in verse 5 here, how we need to bear one another's burdens, for each one shall bear his own load. So the gospel, you know, as we examine ourselves in verse 4, the gospel will also reveal to us, to each one of us, what our burdens are. You know, I, I was listening to a program today t- talking about stress and things like that. And I was in- interesting to see how, you know, he encouraged people to examine themselves to the place so that they can see, you know, what the burden is that, they, that they're carrying and, and not to carry it alone, but be able to have maybe one or two others that can help you to carry that burden. And that's why, for each one shall bear his own load. So there's lots we can learn about concerning the gospel. The first five points, that we, we begin to just see how the gospel, as it is planted, as it is sown, it's going to help restore. It's going to help us to bear things with one another. It's going to help us in examining ourselves. It's going to reveal things to us. And it's going to show us that we need to share. But now as we move on into verse 7 through to the verse 10, we're going to see the, the analogy or the picture of how Paul is going to bring this all together now about sowing and reaping. Because he says in verse 7, when we go, uh, yeah, in verse 7, actually we need to go back up to uh, verse 6 just for a moment. Because in verse 6, this is where the idea of sharing, I got ahead of myself a little bit, where the gospel reveals, but also there is the gospel of sharing, where he says in verse 6, let us, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And again, it's just talking about as we work with one another, you know, I, I tell a lot of businessmen and a lot of supporters we're not doing it alone. We're doing it together. You know, when, when, when farmers and business people and others that are investing in the ministry of Project Lamps, I might be on the cutting edge. And then, but there's times that I need to be retooled. I need to be resharpened. But we are working together so that we can go out and bring forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul was saying, hey, just don't put all the responsibility on the, the pastor or on the, the teacher, but also share with them. Help pull the burden along, because that's why he's saying in the earlier in verse 5, remember that there's a burden, there's struggles and things that are going on, that we bear our loads, but we also help each other. Then he goes on and talks about the, those who are teachers to us, those who are helpers with us. Let's then work together with them so that we can share all good things together as one who listens to the word and as one who teaches the word. I love that. I love that. You know, sometimes a lot of people, I've traveled to a lot of countries around the world, but one of the things that I love that I I, I see happening everywhere I go, you know, a lot of countries don't have finances, but I love it when almost everywhere I go, People have tried to share, tried to give something. I've been given eggs. <laughs> I've been given a machete. I've been given, oh, I mean, the list goes on, a, a catch-in bag. I've been given a, a, a turban. I've been given many, many longies. <laughs> I've been given. I mean, people, you know, they realize that, yes, we come from North America, and we're probably a little bit better financially off than they are. But you know, that doesn't stop them from sharing with the teacher or sharing with each other. You know, sometimes I go into their homes after the services and after teaching, they invite me over, you know, and they may have only had five chickens, but they've killed one, they've cooked it, and now they want to share it with the teacher because they know as they share, there is a blessing. You know, it's a, there's a blessing in working with one another when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? 
I've seen that. Yes, we get the blessings to carry it out. And sometimes because we're right on the front lines, we get the blessings of that, experiencing that. But God wants all of us to have the blessing. That's why I love to come back and give testimonies in churches or write a testimony in the newsletter saying, look what we have done together as a team, as a body of believer. Some things, like you take David's song, there's probably been now 30 or 40 people that have had to come together to make that happen. And we have been blessed and they have been blessed. And together, we've been able to bless someone else. Working it together. That's why when he begins to talk in verse 6, he says, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Then he goes on, but says, But don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. There is a time, you know, the people sow sparingly and they reap sparingly. And Paul wants the church to know that. You know, I, I think you'll lose out on a blessing. One thing I've learned from the Asians and especially the Ketchin people, they know that if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You know, they they often they don't have a lot, but they're also not just throwing you the crumbs off the table. They're giving you what they have. And because of that, I believe they are also reaping a bounty for the Lord. People are coming to Christ. People's lives are being changed because they're not sowing sparingly. You know, it's sad that some people, they hold on to it and hold on to it, or they sow it into their own flesh, sow it into their own desires that will not reap much rewards at all. But if you sow it into the kingdom of heaven, into the kingdom of God, and you sow it generously, you're going to reap generously. Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe that's a principle of God. God has sown generously into our lives. And now he is going to allow us to reap also a blessing by, by joining together with him. That's what Paul is trying to say here. You know, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But you know, every man needs to be a sower. And I've said this before in many lessons I've been teaching over the last little while. And, and I'm going to, you know, step on a few toes here right tonight. But sowing is not something you do inside the four walls of the local assembly. Sowing is getting out amongst the people, getting out into the highways and byways, getting out there and proclaiming the gospel, broadcasting the seed. You know, you got to start telling. If you're a businessman, you've got to, you got to sow an advertisement. you got to sow in telephone calls. you got to sow, 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 so that you can begin to reap, reap, reap. And it's no different, you know, with, even with a farmer. If he goes along and has tremendous, you know, uh, fields, beautiful looking fields, black fields, but never sown any soul, so a seed, he's not going to have anything at the end of the season. People are going to drive by and say, how come your field is full of weeds? What happened? Oh, nothing. I prepared it all, but I didn't need to sow. I just trusted in God. And I believe God was going to give me a harvest. Well, Paul is saying that's not the truth of the gospel. If you're going to receive something from the gospel, you got to sow with the gospel. You understand what I'm saying? I know this may be harsh and it may be a challenge, but that's what it's all about. we got to be sowing the gospel. Whatever God has given to us, sow it back into his kingdom. Sow it back into his fields. Just keep going out. And that means moving outside of the four walls of the local assembly. He goes on. The, people, the, the gospel principle he gives to us here of the sowing and the reaping. This is, this is, I think, is the key to what Paul is saying. Paul is saying to the Galatian church, the, the real hub of the wheel when it comes to the gospel, you need to sow it. But as you sow it, you're going to reap more of it. Can you say amen to that? As you sow it, you're going to reap more of it. Do you believe that? I believe that. I believe God wants us to keep sowing. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. That doesn't mean it's going to be a challenge. 
That doesn't mean that there may be some dry seasons or packed grounds or rocky grounds or uh, fields full of weeds, but we're to keep sowing because the promises of God is this. If you sow, you will reap. And I believe that's a principle that God has put into every one of our lives. And that's what Paul was trying to say. If teachers are sowing into you, bless them. Sow back into them. If you go out and take the seed of the gospel, he said, don't be deceived. You know, people are being deceived. Well, if I just hang on to it for that rainy day or uh, or when I get more, I will give more at that time. No, be constantly getting involved. Sowing and sowing and sowing. And do not be deceived. Because he says, God is not mocked when it comes to sowing and reaping. God's not mocked. God's not deceived. He knows exactly what's going on. He's saying to us, you know, come on now, just start sowing. Just start putting it into the ground. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man, whatever. Notice this. If you're sowing time, if you're sowing finances, if you're sowing uh, prayer, whatever may be. He says, whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Did you get that? Whatever he sows, he will reap. And I love that because God wants us to be sowers, but not only be sowers, but also be reapers. We're to sow the gospel, and I believe God wants us to also reap the gospel. But then he goes on in verse 8, and he talks something. He now moves this whole sowing and reaping of the gospel into the gospel of the Spirit. Because he says in verse 8, For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. So he's warning us. If you're sowing to the flesh, if you're doing the things of the world and you're just sowing for your own kingdom, your own kingdom will fall apart. There will be no more. But if you're sowing in the spirit, you're laying up treasures in heaven. We need to think about that. I think about that often. What am I doing? How am I using my time? How am I taking that which God has given to us to give to others? How, you know, people uh, give finances to Project Lambs and we just don't, you know, throw it out in the middle of nothing. We carefully pray things through and sow and take time to work with people, sow into their lives so that they can sow into other lives so that there can be a harvest. But he's telling us, he's warning us that what we do, we need to be sowing not in the flesh, but sowing in the spirit. Now, I don't know how many of us have thought about that because how often it is, you know, all we want from the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit, give us peace. Holy Spirit, teach us. Holy Spirit, comfort us. But I wonder how many of us have actually prayed, Holy Spirit, help me to sow today. I want to sow in the Spirit today, Lord. And I want to sow in the Spirit today, Lord, because I know your principle is this, that if I sow in the Spirit, I will also reap in my Spirit. We have not because we ask not. We don't receive because we don't plant. God wants to sow more into your life. But we need to sow more together with the Holy Spirit into the gospel, the ministry of Jesus Christ throughout this earth. And as we do that, he says, For he who sows to the flesh will reap, will flesh reap corruption. But he who sows in the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. That's an amazing thought. See, the gospel is trying to bring all of us, the sowing of the gospel is to trying to bring as many as possible into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a kingdom of everlasting life. That's what God wants us to sow. That's what God wants us to, to, to mature it. And so then when we go into not only that in verses 8, but he then begins to talk to us in verse 9 and says, And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. 
So again, that's the, the, the challenge that we sometimes run is that we run the race real quickly and we do not prepare for the long haul. We, we, we prepare for the 100 yard dash, but we don't prepare for the marathon. And I know I have to work on that myself. I'm, I'm, I tend to be a 100 yard dash runner and my wife tends to be the marathon runner. And, and, you know, taking time and working it through and praying it through and seeking the will of God and all that. And here he's saying to us, don't grow weary. Don't grow weary. Just because you don't see it all happening right at this moment, the gospel will fulfill itself. It will fulfill if we don't grow weary. You know what I mean? So often we start to grow weary and then we give up. Paul is saying, don't grow weary. What do you have in your hand? What do you have? Plant that. And as you plant that, then God will give you more. He will give you more in the spirit. He will give you more to your life and strengthen you and help you to move further down the road. That's what he's trying to say here. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, while doing good, for in due season. Notice it says that. In the proper time and in the proper season of the Lord, in due season, we shall reap. We shall reap. But the problem is, he says, you know what the problem is, Paul says? The reason why we don't reap often because we've grown weary and we've lost heart. We need to understand that God wants us not to lose heart, but he wants us to be able to Continue on. And I thank God for what he's going, he is doing. So he's saying to us here in verse 9, again, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. I don't know about you, but a lot of people with COVID-19 and different things that are going on right now are losing heart. Are losing and, and like they're they're kind of giving up and saying what what's coming out of this? What is taking place? What is God trying to do in our lives? And what He's trying to do is to use His gospel to flow through us to plant into others, so that in due season we will receive a harvest. Amen. Do you believe that God wants to give you a harvest today? Do you believe that God wants to use you in a powerful way today? I do. But we need to sow. We need to sow in the Spirit. We need to sow in the Word. We need to sow in prayer. We need to sow in giving. We need to sow in serving. We need to sow with our finances. Whatever He's given to us, put it in. Put it in. And I, you will see that as you put it in, you will reap a great blessing. As long as we don't lose heart. And that's not an easy task. I know as you get older, at least I've been experiencing, and I know some of you say, well, you're not very old. Well, that's okay. I feel like that some days. But as you get older, you have to work a little bit more harder on not losing heart by what's going on around you or what might be happening to your body or your aches and pains and all those things. And you wonder if the things that you're doing are having any um, consequences or any reaction to the people that you're ministering to or whatever. And what God is saying, hey, just keep sowing and don't lose heart. You know, and this is when Colwyn's going to keep saying amen, right, Colwyn? <laughs> just keep sowing and don't lose heart. I better circle that verse tonight. But I think that's a verse for all of us. Just keep sowing, keep planting in the Spirit, keep sowing in the Spirit. And don't lose heart, because in due time, in due season, you will bring forth a harvest. I have seen it thousands and thousands of times. Whatever God has given you, sow it. Whatever little thing that he has put in your hand, sow it. Whatever he has entrusted to you, like those three men in the parable, whether he's given you a few talents or one talent, whatever it may be, Invest it and sow it for God's glory. Because you will see that as you do that, God will bring about a harvest. Amen. 
Well, now Paul is just finally going to come to the end of these 10 verses. And he's going to use the word therefore, which means he's going to sum up now what he's been saying. He's going to tie it all together and remind us what we need to be doing. So what does he say? Therefore, as we have opportunity, as we have opportunity, that means there's opportunities often around about us, but we often don't see them. But as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. I love that. When you have opportunity, don't miss the opportunities, but try to do what you can do to help others around you. Other believers, other people. You know, I'm so blessed that many of the people on our street are Christians. They love the Lord. And we've developed a, a, a blessing of being able to try to help one another and to try to encourage one another. He says, Paul is doing this, all this, he's, he's summing up all this sowing and, and, and reaping. And he's saying, therefore, as you have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith, especially to those who are believers, not only just to your neighbors, but really sow in to other believers. Really plant in other believers' lives that are around about you. Plant in those lives. I remember when we used to go out to various countries and they said, you know, Pastor, you just, you keep planting into our lives and planting into our lives and planting into our lives. And we've got no way of giving anything back. And I said, don't worry about it. Because I said, there may be a dumb day coming where it will you be your turn where God has blessed you with many things, and now you will have to sow back the other way. We need to remember one another. We need to remember our brothers and sisters of faith, not only here in our local neighborhood, but also in our province, in our country, and those around the world. You know, right now there's horrible and terrible things going on with the believers and non-believers in the country of Myanmar, and many other countries around the world. But this is when we can be doing spiritual sowing. We can be praying for them. We can be, you know, entrusting them into God's word. But also we may be able to help those who are doing ministries in those countries and sow into those people's lives through other people. Whatever it may be, you sow and you sow, and I know you will reap. And God will bless you. So we need to be encouraging one another, as Paul says here. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of the faith or the household of the gospel. So as we conclude tonight, I just want to remind you how the gospel restores, how the gospel helps us to bear one another's burdens, how the gospel challenges us to examine ourselves. How through the gospel it reveals to us various things that maybe need to be changed in our lives. And that we need to be sharers of the gospel. And that the gospel principle is sowing and reaping. That another principle is that we need to be sowing in the spirit. And that as we sow in the Spirit, the Spirit of God will strengthen us. It will strengthen us in our heart. And the result of all what the gospel is doing in us and through us will give us an opportunity to be a blessing and encouragement to others. Amen. So let's be sowers of the gospel. And I know that as you sow the gospel, you will also reap the gospel. Let's pray. Father. I just pray, O oh God, that your gospel, your living word, would just continue to be in our hearts, continue to cause us to grow. And Father, that as we, as what you have given to us, that we may take it and sow it into the lives of others. So Lord, I just want to place everyone who's been watching tonight, let them be gospel sowers of good seed. And Lord, I pray that as you give them seed, that Lord, that you will also let them be not only gospel sowers, but gospel harvesters. 
where they will see an opportunity not only to bless others, but to be a blessing one to another. And so, Father, I just thank you for the time of and the opportunity to look into the book of Galatians tonight and see a little bit more how that we can be carriers and sowers of the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks now in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for all of you who have been waving and watching and and connecting and praying and, and helping in every all kinds of ways. We love you. And Lord willing, we pray that we can see you again next Sunday as we can continue our study on the book of Galatians about the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. And hope to see you again tomorrow. And remember, we love you now. Bye-bye.